I'm really not going to talk today about systems biology or some of the work we've done in science to integrate Eastern and Western medicine. I think I'm going to talk about something a little more interesting. Hopefully you'll enjoy it. How many people have seen this movie, Jackie Robinson movie? Anyone? It's a great movie. You know, I, I actually saw it on the flight down, and I actually decided to change my slides, and it actually moved me very, very deeply. And I actually cried probably about three or four times on the trip because it um, provided me a perspective on some of the stuff I've gone through, what I'm going to talk about today, what I call systems and revolution. Um, this is actually an article that appeared in the Huffington Post. You know, my mom died in the end of 2011. Before she died, she'd saved this whole bunch, a suitcase of all the materials that I had, that she had actually saved in inventing email back in 78. And it's an interesting thing. I didn't talk a lot about it, but one of my friends actually um, brought this up to the Huffington Post, which was actually the first to carry this article, that a 14-year-old boy in 1978, in fact, invented email. That was in Time Magazine. And then subsequent to that, a number of articles came out. So this was actually a newspaper article that came out in 1980 in the local newspaper about this young kid um, creating email. And uh, the reason I'm sharing this with you is that one of the interesting things is that what is email? And this is a question that comes up. In 1978, I had actually finished a bunch of my math courses as a 14-year-old child, and I was actually planning on dropping out of high school. So my mom was actually very upset, and she introduced me to a physicist by the name of Les Michelson, who actually worked in Newark, New Jersey, in a medical college. And Dr. Michelson um, saw this 14-year-old boy, and he didn't treat him like a child. He actually trot, uh, uh, taught him as an equal, treated him very much a, as an equal. And he gave me this interesting opportunity. He said, Shiva, you know, we have this thing called the inter-office mail system. Probably anyone over the age of 40 remembers this inbox, outbox, folders, address book, Right? And this was a whole system on how offices ran, from the office of the president to the office of the prime minister, and uh, in fact, any office in the world. And he said, would you like to create the electronic version of this system? And obviously, I uh, thought it was an amazing experience, and, and I ended up creating it. Now, here's the interesting thing. I called it email, and it was an int the only reason I called it email was it's, um, in, I wrote it in the Fortran 4 language at that time, you could, everything was written in uppercase, and you could only have five characters, okay? So this was not a term that was obvious in 1978. In fact, the Oxford English Dictionary puts it at 1979, and the Merriam-Webster puts it at 82, because in 82, I applied for the copyright. There was no patent protection for software. In fact, the U.S. Copyright Office didn't even recognize software until 1980 when the Copyright Act of 76 was changed, so I apply for it. That was the way you protected intellectual property. So this young kid does this. No lawyers. Uh, downloads it. I'm not downloads it. Orders the, <laughs> the orders the application. Pays his ten dollars, and you can see there's email. Now, um, here's the interesting thing. Now, Time Magazine was one of the few. Uh, Doug Ameth was the one who actually went through all the material my mom had saved, and he wrote the article. And that that was a important story that came out. And in fact, when I came to MIT in 1981, the front page carried, uh, you know, they highlighted three students, and one of them was this kid who invented email. I didn't think much about this because I was actually very deeply interested in medicine because my, I had grown up in India, in, a, in, in Bombay, but also in a village, and my grandmother was one of these Siddhars, ancient, you know, Siddha and Arve that was one of the traditional medicines of India. And, and I was moved by the way that she could actually observe people's faces and understand what was going on in her body. So my intention was always to understand traditional systems of medicine. So the email thing was actually sort of a side effect that I did. But here's the thing that happened. After the Time Magazine article came out, the Smithsonian asked for my materials. And this is when the proverbial something hit the fan. Um, Washington Post after the Smithsonian accepted the materials in February, he wrote this article called V.A. Shiva Honored as the Inventor of Email. And this is where I believe we as sages and scientists really need to look at the real reality of if we're going to actually change science on who writes narratives. Because my personal experience show, you know, demonstrates to me that we live in a very, very interesting world right now, that there is a limited set of large institutions which control narratives on what is innovation and what is science. And until we are willing to look at this boldly and actually smash it up, we're not going to move a lot of science forward. And I'm going to share with you my personal experience because when this article came out, 
It was like the immune system in the cell reacted. You see, it was okay, it was in time, it was okay, it was in the Huffington Post, but when it went into the Smithsonian, it set off a whole bunch of noise. (laughs) You can't see it, but people took my picture and they said, imposter. Um, People said this guy, all sorts of four-letter words. And in fact, fortunately, I've removed some of the texture, but this is the kind of stuff that came out. This person is a curry stain Indian. He should be hung and be- beaten. Okay? This is 2012 now. Okay? We're not talking about 1960. Now, what's fascinating is no one at MIT supported me except Noam Chomsky. This shows also the spineless, uh, spinelessness, frankly, of academia, and I'll get back to this. And it's not a small word that I use because it shows down again into where we are today in 2013. Who was behind this? Well, when you look at this, again, this is an example, an internet cabal of historians called SIGCIS, which, interestingly enough, um, is indirectly supported by Raytheon, BBNN. See, you see a $35 billion company called Raytheon BBNN had decided around 2000 that they would write the narrative on who the inventor of email was. So the at sign was used prior to 1978, but it was for the exchange of text messages, not the inner office mail system, inbox, outbox, folders, the 50,000 lines of code that 14-year-old boy wrote. This organization had worked on text messaging protocols dating back to Morse code. But it was to their advantage to really talk about the fact that they actually owned the dialogue around electronic mail. So if you look at this website, it's beautifully done. Innovation, the at symbols or logo, and they have their mascot. So essentially, I I set off a proverbial hornet's nest when the news had come out in the Smithsonian, and the system that reacted was fascinating. So what did we do? Uh, Myself, a number of other students at MIT, we actually put together the site called The Inventor of Email. And what was good for us was one of the students, unfortunately, I'll, I'll read it to you, was one of the students, a very dedicated undergraduate, went through bowels of microfiche at MIT, and he found this. He goes, at this time, no attempt is being made to emulate the full-scale interorganizational mail system. The fact that the system is intended for various organizational contexts and by users of different expertise makes it almost impossible to build a system which responds to all user needs. Now, David Crocker was the one who was attacking me. He was part of SIG CIS. He'd forgotten he'd, ri- he had written this in December of 1977. Right? Crocker is part of the BBN gang. So... Now, who came to my aid? Chomsky. Now, Noam I've known since an undergrad. Noam is, you know, one of the few people who actually does tell the truth. I consider him a sage and a scientist. And Chomsky went through the facts, and he said, you know, email was invented by a 14-year-old boy in 1978. Now, for me, this was not the only struggle I'd fought. You see, a few years before this, three years ago, On the innovation side, I had gone back to India on a Fulbright in 2008, and I was recruited by the Indian government to run the largest innovation center in India, right under the prime minister's office, for what's called CSIR, the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research. For 70 years, CSIR actually hadn't done any innovation. So I come in, and as, by the way, as a scrappy entrepreneur, I went around and met amazing scientists all over India. Very capable people, but for 70 years, by the way, India has not produced any indigenous Nobel Prize scientists and, uh, within India. So I decided, I met these people, and I wrote up a report which basically said that if Indian science needed to move forward, we would have to have transparency and democracy. At the time I was writing this report, half of the building I was in had, was burned down because the director general was under audit for embezzling around $35 million. Okay, So this report gets released, and obviously in the report I was very critical, honest report, and I was fired in about uh, three hours after this report got released. (laughs) And this appeared on Hindustan Times. Subsequent to this, I gave an interview for Star News. Right before I was about to do this interview, I was told if you do this interview, you'll be jailed. And what's fascinating was here, I was about to do this interview, and I called the U.S. Embassy, and they said, Dr. Idra, you should come in right away. But it was that instant, you know, I thought about my grandparents, who were poor farmers, and the fact that I had four degrees from MIT, I had this nice bungalow in Delhi, and what was I doing? So I ended up doing the interview, 
And uh, it hit prime time news, went all over India. And right after that, my father-in-law at the time, who had told me, you know, Shiva, don't make waves. You should simply be quiet. One day you'll be minister of science and technology. That career sort of went out the door. <laughs> and I ended up crossing the border to Nepal, going to Kathmandu, Qatar, and I came back home to the United States. When I got home, the editors of Nature, one of the most prestigious science magazines, asked me to write a commentary, which I did. And the commentary was Innovation Demands Freedom, Why America Innovates and India May Never. Now, America also has its problems. We'll, we'll get to that. But this article went up on Nature. The editors of Nature backed it. The Indian government threatens to sue Nature. Nature editors threaten in India, and they pull it down. Okay. So, Bhargava, by the way, one of the most eminent scientists of India. There is a great lab in India called CCMB. Bhargava started it 50 years, very outspoken scientist. He actually wrote to the prime minister, and he said, look, everything in Shiva's report is absolutely honest. You should meet with him. I've been in this organization for 50 years. Obviously, the prime minister didn't want to meet with me. Now, the problem is the people who hired me forgot. They actually did get a good guy, but they actually got, may have hired the wrong guy. This is actually a picture of me burning the South African flag on the steps of MIT in 19, I think, 85. System of apartheid existed at MIT. The board of MIT still had investments in South Africa. We finally got the board to get them out. This is actually a picture of me challenging, at that time, the president of MIT. Another example, a friend of mine was jailed by the Sri Lankan government at the time of uh, the Tamil struggle there. And he was a scientist, the prime minister of uh, India had come, uh, uh, Sri Lanka had come to visit. We got him out. And this is me at my graduation, PhD graduation at MIT. The reason I'm sharing this with you is, you know, in the great conversations we've had, we've had talked about sages and scientists. And I think Jim Carrey asked one of the speakers when we were talking about these notions of evolution doesn't support truth, but there are disruptions that take place and what happens when those take, take place, and what, what are the conditions. So one of the things I did at MIT was we started a course at MIT called Systems Visualization. It's a very subversive course. And the goal, purpose of this course was to teach students what are systems, complex systems, and how do you uh, convey this complexity. So we would start students with understanding this kind of complexity, how the media, for example, this is actually a systems drawing. And then the students would do drawings, and they would be, be here's actually a drawing of 9-11. The point is the students learn to take complexity and be able to express it as very, very powerful graphics. And this became the most popular course at MIT, ironically. The entire incident with the invention of email, what's fascinating is, is in India, the corruption in science is pretty straightforward. Everyone's aware of it. In America, what we have is it's very sophisticated. You see, the corruption is not so direct. You have this very interesting collusion that takes place between, in this case, a $35 billion company called Raytheon, academic institutions who get, in some ways, indirectly, directly paid to write narratives. And in the course that we teach at MIT, we really try to teach students about these narratives. What I want to say in closing is, when we look at the ancient sages of India, they really talked about the fact, and I think a number of people have mentioned this, that there's a divinity that exists in every human being. And if you truly believe that, if all of us really believe that, what does that mean? That means if there is a divinity within us, the power of that divinity is to create, right? Innovate. And if there is a devil, it is anything that inhibits innovation. When we think about a number of these stories, this is actually a picture of a, uh, Mishkin who wrote this report on the financial stability of Iceland, which was later found out to be false, Professor Columbia. When we look at the fact that we've had 50-year scientists said smoking was good for us, again, science. And then we have the fact, as we talked about earlier, that this gentleman, Galileo, got crucified for saying that the sun was the center of the solar system. So the invention of email story, the reason I wanted to share this with you, it's really not about me anymore. It's much deeper. It's about a 14-year-old boy, an immigrant dark-skinned boy, who in 1978 in Newark, New Jersey, invents email. You see, the reason that this vitriol took place is really not about me in many ways, it's really more about this narrative that got busted up. And that narrative is innovation, can, innovation does not only take place in large institutions 
you know, big companies and large universities. In fact, the, the truth is that innovation can take place anytime, any place by anybody. And that's what the truth is. Thank you. You did well. You did well. You did very well. Right. So, <laughs> yes. I just wanted to say that 30 years ago when I started talking about Ayurveda, it seemed so unscientific. And then we started talking about qualia, and I realized that Ayurveda is qualia medicine. But then Shiva came along, and he said, I can create the science for Ayurveda. Systems biology. The universe is a system in consciousness. And it's a biological organism in consciousness and here's how we'll mathematically model it. So, you know, starting with Don Hoffman this uh, afternoon and ending up here, almost ending up here, is it's a kind of a full circle, you know. So you uh, are now, you know, tell them just for one minute how we can bypass the current FDA system. Sure. He's an iconoclast. So, you know, it takes 13 years, $5 billion to create a drug today. You know, you do stuff in a test tube, you kill a bunch of animals, and then you actually kill a bunch of humans after that, too. Okay? <laughs> right? But what we've done is, if you look at the reality, what's possible with computing now, if we actually believe in the mechanistic understanding of molecular pathways and the fact that biology is actually a distributed science, in post-2002, after the human genome was sequenced, the realization was that, what occur that all humans and worms have about 20,000 genes. So the interesting thing is not the genes, but the molecular reactions. So a challenge was put forward by the National Science Foundation, I'm sorry, I should also look over here, that could you use technology to create a computational model of the cell, in silico model of the cell. So I, that's what we ended up doing, and we created this infrastructure called Cytosol out of my PhD work at MIT. Now, what we wanted to do was we wanted to essentially go head on head against the drug guys. So what we did was we um, took this technology and we said, could we model mechanistically, not statistically, uh, something like pancreatic cancer, which we've done. Then we took the existing set of nutraceuticals and compounds out there, and we've been able to combine it without killing any animals. Um, last month, the FDA actually said they were going to give us the allowance to go into clinical trials with this multi-combination drug. What is important about this is that we're going to shorten the drug development cycle significantly. And what's even more interesting is the FDA is actually pretty cool. It's the pharma guys who make the FDA look bad. The FDA actually wants to make sure they don't, we don't kill people. But the FDA actually called us, which is very rare, and they said, you know, we really want to work with you. And off the record, they stayed on the phone three hours with us. So what I'm trying to say is that when you look at what's going on in systems biology, when you look at the fact what's going on in computing, but we also have to recognize we need to bust up these paradigms that most of these institutions which control the world now have actually failed us. And, it, and if we want to be sages and scientists, we also have to be revolutionaries, frankly. And we have to go head on head against these guys. 